nice to you wave, wave at me. You're awake, you're alive, and welcome. I haven't seen you in a while, it's so good to see you guys. Well, we're gonna worship the Lord. We wanna be free in this place. We know that he's the first and the last. He's on the throne, he's not moved or shaken by anything in our lives. Praise God that we have our hope secure in him. He's the anchor, he is not moved. So we're gonna worship the Lord, why don't you just be free to do what, we got lots of space here on the sides, be free, dance, sing, and let's worship him. Forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters of my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me. Oh, 
stepped into my Egypt, and you took me by the hand, and you marched me out of freedom, straight into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God, and I'll sing of all you've done. Death has followed up forever by the glory of your love. Just the voices, you're the God. the king of my heart be the shadow where I lie the ransom for my life oh yes my let's sing that again let the king let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh yes my the king of love be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh yes my soul yes you are good you're good oh you are good you're good Okay. 
whatever pain you're going through, whatever's heavy on your heart, don't let the enemy have it. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't give the enemy his pain. And he, we have that same power, we have that same love in us. That maybe you need to say that today out loud, even a sacrifice of praise, that the enemy cannot have your pain. Jesus gets it all, he wastes nothing.
just to come back to this chorus, but I want to read to you from Psalm 124. It says this, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, let the Life Connection family say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our souls. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken. And we have escaped. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help. Can you say that with me? My help. My help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So this morning, let's sing that again. Let our souls stand before our King and magnify Him this morning. One morning this week, um, I just had a picture come to me of someone on a diving board, and they're just looking down into the depths, and it's dark, not in a scary way, but just in the sense that you couldn't see the bottom. And I just felt God say, you don't know the depths of peace that I have for you. You've just scratched the surface, and, and I want you to dive in, and I want you to see. And I just felt it especially um, just in terms of his word, and just being in his word, abiding in his word, when we're there with him, um, we don't know how deep his peace really is. And when we go there, we can dive in. We can start to discover those depths. But it never ends. That's the crazy thing. We don't know his depths of peace because they just go on and on and on. And it's so exciting. We get to explore that with him. And we get to know his peace more deeply. And... Um, Yes, yeah, so I just want to declare that over us. God, thank you that your depths of peace 
knows no bounds, that we can dive in, that we can plunge into it unafraid, God, because you have greater depths for us than we can ever know. Thank you, God, that your depths of peace are for us. And I just think of that song in Christ alone, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when striving cease, uh, when fears are still, when striving cease. God, thank you for your depths. Thank you for the depths of your peace. If you need, if you need to experience that peace, I want you to put your hand up right now so that we can pray with you. If there's a hand up close to you, can you just stand around them and pray? Let's pray for one another this morning for the depths of God's peace. Not just the little, oh, I feel better because I had a chocolate bar or my third cup of coffee at nine o'clock, but the depths of His peace. Father, I thank you this morning across this room, God. For those online, Jesus, for those that we carry on our hearts that we know desperately need, desperately, desperately need the peace of God, the depth of your peace. Father, we speak peace. We say, Jesus, may they encounter and may we encounter the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace, and the layers and layers and layers and layers of your peace and your presence. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So great to be back. Great to see all of you. I'm getting text, text messages from people watching online that says thank you for that word. So Father, I thank you that right now in homes, Jesus, across sound waves, that your presence minister, that your presence permeate the earth. Just breathe, breathe, oh God. Breathe on your children this morning. Breathe on your children. Can you turn to someone next to you and say, I am his. I am his, Dorothy. <laughs> um, the kids and I got back on Sunday from a really, really special time in the UK at the conference. Jess, can you put up those photos for me, please? Um, You'll see Tony Fitzgerald and then Louis and Ed, um, and then we had a panel session, the one they had, I think, all the North American guys up there. So there's some UK people, but um, just such a special time to be together with the Church of the Nations family. And then the picture in the corner, bottom left, um, the kids and I had a meal with the church in, um, oh, I can't even say the name, but it's in the Netherlands. Um, and just such a lovely time with the church there. And we just, I just love the Netherlands, all the pastries and the coffee and the flowers. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Um, but it was great. Um, as I was just thinking about this morning and I was like, oh, I should remember to receive tithes and offerings. And I was like, and God reminded me of something so beautiful. Um, and I haven't seen it until this morning because I last night I was like oh right and then this morning I was like oh my gosh um, God reminded me of his provision for us through before and through the trip and I was like wow God you've been so gracious and kind and even you know crazy stories like at times uh, we went by what was it bus from London to Southampton and African Canadian, whoever can figure out the bus system, and then the guy didn't let us pay, and there's eight of us, and he's like, "No, it's fine, you can just go." Just things like that, over and over again. Bus drivers that obviously see that I'm clueless, and he's like, "It's okay, just get on, just get on." But just God reminded me of all of that, and then I started thinking of the financial blessings that we've received for the trip, and I was like, "Wow, God, you've been so amazing." And then I've added it up in my mind, and um, God reminded me of a few months ago, um, friends of ours were traveling, and I just had it on my heart to bless them and their kids for their trip. And um, it wasn't a, 
big amount, but it was just, I really just wanted to bless them. I was so excited for them to travel. And when I think of what God's done for us, it was 20-fold that amount. And it's like, wow, God, I didn't even do it with that in mind. It wasn't a, God, here's my seed. Can you please multiply it? Because I'm taking five kids across, not across the world, just across the water. It wasn't that. And I was like, wow, God, you are so awesome. You know, when we just do it, not with other motivations. Um, so I want to encourage you as we receive tithes and offerings this morning. Your God is a faithful God. My God is so faithful. I'm blown away by his kindness and his grace and his goodness. Um, if anyone has a testimony, I want you to come up um, while I make some announcements. So if anyone has a testimony from this week that you want to share, please come up. Um, we have a training week coming up in May, May 6 to 8. We're doing kingdom finances. And I want to encourage you, if you have not... Um, uncovered and discovered God's ways, I want to encourage you to come and join us for that. John Redekop will um, lead this and facilitate this. So Monday and Tuesday night will be online. Wednesday night will be in person. So as much as we look at what the Word of God says, biblically, financially, and all of that, Wednesday night, we're going to look at closed circle budgets and all of that. I want to say this as you come closer and closer. Understanding three-dimensional giving has changed my life. I remember years ago when we got this teaching and I, God gave me the revelation of three-dimensional giving. It's changed my life. So that in every single season, no matter how tight and uncomfortable it gets, there's always seed to sow. That's God's heart. You know, so if you're in debt this morning and you're feeling pressure or you're just feeling like, my gosh, I just don't know how to feed my family anymore. God's heart is for us to thrive in every single season. And the nature of debt is to overwhelm us and cause us not to see God's ways. Cause us not to see there's always an opportunity to sow seed, and he provides that seed to sow if we can understand his heart and his ways. So I want to encourage you, May 6 to 8, Kingdom Finances, Monday, Tuesday online with John, and then Wednesday night we'll be in person where we work through closed circle budgets and what all of this means, testimonies. Heidi, you're on your own. This is a tag team testimony, but Janet was like, no, you just go do it. So um, this is about life group more than anything else. So in life group, we were going through the glorious church and all this kind of stuff. And the topic of how do we do this it, with our neighbors, with our neighbors just kept coming up. How do we love, love our neighbors? And then a couple weeks ago when I was hosting, we prayed for um, how to reach out to our neighbors and all that kind of thing. Well, that Tuesday in life group, Janet goes, I can't believe this week, it's just been so much. I have had four or five different encounters with different neighbors this week that I have been trying to reach out to. And it's just this beautiful coming together of being in community because she was concerned about her neighbors. I wanted to pray for neighbors, and then she was able to have these interactions with her neighbors and just speak life and love over them. And it's just been been beautiful some of them she hadn't seen in like a couple of years even though they live across the street and all this kind of stuff so it's just it's just beautiful to be in community and to just be a part of what each other are doing so and just yeah um so this one's a little bit more on a somber note but <laughs> um but just a testimony of god's goodness and yeah i came prepared <laughs> <laughs> um, so this week we found out we were pregnant, which was really exciting. But then on Wednesday I miscarried, and and it's it's hard, obviously. <laughs> but it's um, it's been just a testimony of His goodness all the time. All the time He is good. He is never failing, never ending, and that His care, His peace, is so present, and that's something that. I never would have thought going through this, you know, I, 
I would have thought it would felt it would have felt very lonely um, and very um, very just I, f I felt like I would have doubted God's goodness a lot but I haven't and that's just such a testimony of who he is and and just how much he cares for us and yeah so yeah <laughs> Jesus, I thank you for Mitch and Heather and little Joey and Mimi this morning, God. Thank you for your kindness when we walk through the valleys, God. I thank you that you never leave us. You never leave us, God. And I thank you that you never have left them or never will. God, and I thank you for this beautiful expression of your heart this week for them, God. Thank you for your kindness. God, we cover them with prayers. Stand with them. Father, I thank you that they would experience the tenderness of their king continuously in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I've just got a question with God's goodness. Okay. <laughs> so we were looking for a house and um, so some stuff went wrong with where we were and um, we got a very short notice that we have to move the end of April and we're looking for my house is available tomorrow okay. and uh, because it's a dog they won't let us so they won't give us allow us to, to take the house or whatever because it's a dog and I said to God he knows everything and he went on trial with God this is what I see and what I'm experiencing and this week he gave us a house that we can move into and the landlord was gracious he accepted the dog we were the first one that said no please <laughs> and he gave it to us and he also gave us four days ahead of the time that we don't have to pay for and we can do it and so we answered prayers because it was so it was quite stressful because it's we're in the big house and yeah but God is good mercies are new every morning and his grace to sustain us through all of this is just amazing there's chocolates in here and <laughs> yeah. I didn't really want to do this um, I do not like public speaking. My husband loves it and our daughter Janelle was ex excelled at it um, and that's what this story is about. It's really one that I want to tell quickly just all, uh, for the people that don't know us. Uh, we have three children. My husband Jack's away this weekend and I thought all the, m my s other son who attends is John, Amy and the three grandkids and they're not here to <laughs> support me but anyway I'll try not to be too shaky here. Um, this is a, a something that I, I um, copied from an author by the name of Linda Castor. And it says, Linda Castor believes that in every generation the God, that God raises up a Joseph family. He takes these devoted servants through years of troubles and trials to prove and strengthen their faith. He also delivers them from many satanic snares. But the Joseph family is tested. The Joseph, the Joseph family, <coughs> the Joseph family is tested in ways that few others experience. seat I was <laughs> okay um okay sorry guys sorry um I just don't want to take I just don't want to take too long <laughs> okay um <laughs> here we go okay he delivers them from many satanic snares, but the Joseph family is tested in ways that few others experience. And perhaps most painfully of all, they've been tried by God's word. 
How was Joseph tried by God's word? He knew all through his sufferings that he was a righteous man. He knew that he had a heart for God, and that only made his trials more baffling. As he looked, as he looked back over his journey, As he looked back over his journey, he realized, I see how the Lord was in it all. And that makes everything I suffered, every painful, lonely moment, worth it. Joseph made peace with his past because, excuse me, Joseph made peace with his past because he saw God's hand in it. What an incredible revelation for Joseph. Yes, what is the lesson for God's people today? It is this, our Lord has preserved us in the past. He will preserve us in the days ahead. And most importantly of all, he has an eternal purpose behind it all. And there isn't a family in this room who hasn't been touched by trial and pain and suffering. And I'm just going to show the hero of our family, our youngest daughter who passed away at the age of 14, I'm just going to show you a quick picture of her. And she, my husband and I always say we want to be just like her when we grow up. And we mean it from the bottom of our hearts because she loved Jesus with all her heart. She wasn't afraid to, to embrace that she was going to pass. Um, we knew that for, we, at age five, we found out we'd be lucky to have her for a year. And well, that's pretty sobering. But on the way to the hospital, she said to me, I'm pretty lucky, aren't I, Mommy? And I nearly drove off the road. And I said, you are? And she goes, yeah, because I know why I'm here. I'm here to tell the world about how to give blood and give bone marrow and help others. Or I'm here to tell the world about bone marrow and help others get a new life. So this is our little gal. Um, they, the doctors told us that at age five, we'd be lucky to have her for a year. Now... We know that God trumps all. And we just pour it into him. And honestly, I, I, I really mean this from the bottom of my heart. We, we, when we look back now, we see that it was our best years. Because we had nine more years with her. And this top picture is a picture. Uh, you'll see a... Um, shadow or light, you'll see a light coming in through her window, and it's not sunlight. Uh, the day that she, or the day of her funeral, when we'd go into her room, it would be peace in that room. It would be peaceful in her room. And, and my friend, who was like her second mother, took the picture of her bedroom just as a memory, and look what came out. It's incredible. God's angels and light were shining through that room. And the bottom one is a year before her bone marrow transplant. And it looks like, and I'll leave this up here for you to look at later. It looks like there's a little angel of light in her hand. So this is my story. And I'm glad I got to tell you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I think God's trying to say something about peace this morning just keep hearing it over and over and I I don't know who this is for but God's trying to get your attention this morning about his peace about the seasons that we walk and that his peace surpasses understanding let's just take a moment and just breathe it in Breathe in your peace this morning. We breathe you in, Jesus. God, of all of us, even those that think we're okay, we don't need peace, we have peace. God, I thank you for a new depth of understanding of your peace. New understanding of our King Jesus. We receive you this morning, God. We receive you, King Jesus. Receive your peace. Thank you for your
our heart for us, God. When we feel overwhelmed and pressure, God, I thank you that you would say it again and again and again. Because you care so much. You care so much, God. We thank you for your heart this morning. I attended um, the prophetic conference at Southside this week weekend with um, some others. And I left last night just so encouraged by God's heart. Um, it was almost a duplicate of the Cotton Conference in the UK. The messages that were shared, the outpouring of God's presence and prophetic anointing and ministry time. I just left last night in awe of my God. I was like, God, you're so, so amazing. Bigger than what we understand. There's so much to our God that we don't understand yet. And um, I wanted to remind you of two more things coming up this week. Tomorrow, ach, tom yeah, tomorrow night, we have our financial, um, I, I call it the freedom meeting, financial freedom meeting. <laughs> but it is a feedback meeting. Um, seven o'clock online, the email went out on Thursday with the Zoom link. I wanna encourage you, if you've never attended, come. We met as a finance team on Tuesday night. I am blown away by God's goodness in this journey. Promise you, the goodness and kindness and provision of our God is just beautiful. So come and hear testimonies of God's goodness tomorrow night. And then Friday night is Kindle. Kindle, Kindle, Kindle. Shall I say something? No. <laughs> I will not say something. <laughs> Bring your pets. Jenna said, any, any, any instruments are welcome. If you don't have one, you can bring your pot. A pot is an instrument, two lids, not glass lids, anything, anything, a hair dryer, a brush, anything. You bring your wooden spoons, anything. Jenna said anything. Your high heel shoes, have you ever drummed with heels? If you bang them, anything. Jenna's and Jeff are desperately wanting you to bring your instruments. This morning, we're going to release the kids as I welcome our world traveler guest. <laughs> we have the honor of Pastor Ken with us this morning. Ken, won't you come up? I am so grateful for your gracious kindness. You travel all over the world and you are ready. <laughs> ready. Ready as ready. can be. <laughs> You're the globe traveler. No, you You are. just got back. <laughs> Beautiful. <clears throat> Would you open your hearts this morning? Father, I thank yes. you for a son that loves you with all of his heart. God, I thank you that we can honor Pastor Ken in our midst this morning. God, I thank you for your heart for us as your children. Thank you for the feast that you've prepared for us. Thank you that we come with open hearts and says, Jesus, speak. God, speak. Thank, Thank you, you that your words are life. Yes, Father. Life abundantly, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Teresa. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be with you again today. You say, you say that every time. That's because I mean it. With all my heart, yeah, it's a, del a delight to be with you. And uh, always an honor to... Uh, address and look into the Word of God and it's very evident there's some tender moments here in this service you never want to uh, shy away from <coughs> what the Lord is saying <coughs> excuse me I do have a cough drop uh, through uh, the um, the power of testimony uh, we don't have a testimony unless we first been tested and it's after the test that the testimony comes. And we're going to uh, look into the testimony of God. His word is his testimony. And as we uh, listen uh, to everyone's testimony this morning to the 
young woman that has lost her baby. May the Lord grant you an unusual peace that passes understanding. And uh, we lost two between number three and four, but we didn't give up. We just kept going. And we thank God because he knows things about that that none of us know. And many times we'll never know. So you be blessed and be comforted and um, always believe that there is, there is more. There is more in Jesus' name. And um, the testimony of losing a 14-year-old, that uh, is pretty heavy on a dad's heart to have that transpire. God has to grace us for these things and help us so that we can stand again and speak of the, <clears throat> the testimony of God. Uh, there's been a focus here on peace, and I'm not going to negate the peace factor, but all that today we might comprehend not just the depth of his peace, but the depth of his love, the depth of his love for us. About a year or so ago, I had a real encounter with God about walking through the scripture and looking at all the words that are like couplets and triplets in the word of God. Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where it speaks about, at the end of the chapter, it talks about, the greatest of these is love. How many know that scripture? And, but it talks about other words that go with it. So I walk through the scripture to see how many times grace and mercy are together, and faith and hope are together. And you begin to realize, if you take the power of these couplets and triplets, and bring them together and embrace them into our spirit man what happens sometimes there's three and four of them in the Word of God that builds us up on our inside and as I was asked to walk with you in the subject matter of the undefeatable love of God I couldn't believe that Teresa would ask me to do the entire chapter of <laughs> Romans chapter 8 <laughs> So I did an equation with her and I said, you know what, three minutes a verse times 39 <laughs> plus three minutes introduction plus a three minute conclusion, that takes me to 120 minutes. Does anybody have 120 minutes here this morning? So I suggested to her that we have lunch in the in between. She offered pizza. And uh, some of the assignments I get to do in 30 minutes are impossible. <clears throat> But his love. I was watching last week's message about staying alive, staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> Susan, staying alive. That's a, a crazy tune stays with you. But when she read the when she read the lyrics, everything shifts. And people are just staying alive rather than living the life that God has for us. And when, you, when you're in Romans chapter 7, I'm anticipating that as a congregation, you're reading through the book of Romans because that's the only way you're going to get the real benefit out of the book if it's being spoken about, emphasized, preached on, taught about because there's no way that I can unpack 39 verses and not even going to try. But the end of the day, it's about a incredible lo about love what is love about living in the love of God some people have a difficult time comprehending that they are the object of his love some people have an, a difficult time believing that he has set his affection upon us I take great comfort in this that I did not choose him but that he he chose me and set his affection upon me. I love him because he first loved me. So basically what he's looking for is our response to him. Responding to his love. Some have said to me, I, I've done so many bad things. How, how could he love me? in the midst of his, all the bad things I've done, will join the club. 
forgiveness is forgiveness. Forgiveness from sin is forgiveness from sin. And a response to the incredible love of God. I believe he wants us to live loved. And you know, the antithesis of this is the hardest thing in life is rejected love. When I'm rejected by someone that I loved and they loved me and they've rejected my love. Because I was a singles pastor for so long, I dealt with the subject of broken relationships and marriage. Dealing with the, the amount of rejection in this city, the high divorce rate that we have, the city is filled with rejected love. Of people forsaking one, forsaking family, choosing someone else, trying to balance blended families and all these things. I understand the grace in it, but it was never God's design. All oh, that we as Christian people, that we would allow ourselves to be loved by God and love the way he wants us to love, and that we would love the testimony of God so much that we'd straight stay true to the testimony of God. Is your name in the room? And I believe that that's where he literally wants us to love. Romans chapter 8 is often regarded as one of the most significant chapters in all the Bible. It's a halfway point in the book of Romans. It focuses on a number of things in the entire chapter. Life in the spirit. Susan was dealing with last week that we don't have to walk in that life of condemnation because chapter 1 says, now therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that incredible? And so when we come out of a life of sin and we come to Christ, we don't have to deal with that condemnation anymore because Romans chapter 8 is a centerpiece of saying the life of the Spirit that we embrace comes to bring us from a freedom of a life of condemnation into a life of acceptance by Jesus Christ. It emphasizes freedom from condemnation for those who are, who are in Christ Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives and the assurance of God's love and protection for all believers. So when we look, that's kind of like a, a simple overview in, on a slide about what Romans chapter 8 is about. And of course, there's another piece. It also discusses the role of suffering in the lives of believers, but the ultimate victory that there is in Jesus Christ. So when we look at these kinds of things, life in the Spirit, freedom from condemnation, the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives, and the assurance of God's love and protection, how many think that's not a bad chapter? It's probably one of the most quoted chapters, at least parts of it, in all of the scripture, especially verse 1, uh, verse 25, 26, or 13, 14. And we begin to look at the centerpiece of this. I asked myself the question throughout the chapter. So I've isolated a number of points. Hopefully you can take a hold of these things about how his love is reflected to us. Number one in verse number three of Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, I'm just going to go there because I need the, need the scriptures here to support what I'm saying. It says in verse number three, it says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weak in the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So the love of God is demonstrated to us in that he sent his son to love us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If there's anyone here today you've not received of the love and the care of Jesus, he is here to receive you and I this morning and welcome us into his kingdom. Let's look at verse 10 and 11. It speaks about his indwelling love. So beautiful.
But if Christ is in you, and even through your, though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in us. There's a great reason to love him back because he has given up his spirit so the spirit is not more or less than the love of Christ. He is the love of God in three parts. God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit. They all represent the heart on the side that God is love. And that's a tremendous thing that we must uh, comprehend and to welcome and to have the indwelling presence of Christ that's absolutely amazing. When you go to number three here, and we look at Holy Spirit-led leadership. It says here, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit received brought about the adoption of your sonship. So when you look at Spirit-led leadership, I don't know about you, but I'm very grateful to be able to be led by the Spirit. We're doing a series this year called Spirit Engagement. It's about a journey with the Spirit, being engaged with the Holy Spirit and inviting people to share their journeys as to when they became engaged to Holy Spirit. The first thing that happens is we're born of the Spirit. Is that not beautiful? And then the next thing is, we live in the Spirit. And the next thing is, we are led by the Spirit. And there's 12 of them. And you just walk right through the Scripture and think about the love of Jesus Christ so much that when he left, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless or loveless. I'm going to send Holy Spirit to be with you. Aren't you glad that everywhere you go, you don't have to have Jesus with you? Did I really say that, you're saying? Yeah, because the disciples were limited, weren't they? Because they needed Jesus in their life. But what he did when he gave us Holy Spirit, he gave us his portableized presence. So that everywhere we go, we take the Spirit of Jesus with us. So it doesn't matter where we go, what we're doing, he is not separate from us, he is there with us, and he is there. I, I think that's absolutely incredible. Then's my adoption into sonship. I've worked with lots of families who adopt children. There's a great grace when it comes to adoption. It's a different grace than being a birth parent. If you're here today and you were adopted or you have adopted or you're in the process of adoption, I believe that you have already encountered the incredible love of God. Adoption to me is, first of all, it's the only legal part of our salvation. To be adopted into the family of God. That is the distinct, express love of the Father for every one of us. And many of us, there are those who have been adopted into a family, been adopted into the family of God. And they say to me, can I'm twice adopted? And uh, they, they, they work through the natural adoption they welcome their spiritual adoption, and the reflective love of Jesus is that he's adopted every one of us that have been willing to be adopted into his family. And adoption is the beginning of our journey of sonship. That's where it all begins. Some people think that sonship is a foreign doctrine. It begins with the very essence and the beginning of our salvation. It begins right there. We are adopted into the family of God. How many are glad that you've been adopted into the family of God? You've been chosen, handpicked by the Lord to be a part of his family. And it says here, it says, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. So when we receive the love of the Father through the Son by the Spirit, it became a spirit adoption that came to us by the Spirit of God. 
to help us to be able to say, hereby we cry, Abba, Father, Papa, God. Where we can say, it's a wonderful thing to be adopted into the family of God. Why? Because we become heirs with the fathers and joint heirs with the son. That's not too shabby. We're already in his, we're already in the will. Some people are wondering if they're in the will or out of the will. Man, when you got adopted into his will, you're in the will. Can you say with me this morning, I'm in the will. Oh, that was really not that well done. Can we say that again? I'm in the will. Do you know how many fights and skirmishes I've had to break up in funeral homes? People fighting over the will. Is my name in the will? What did I get? Well, when it comes to being in the Father's will, when we step into salvation, we're born of the Spirit, adopted into the family of God, man, we're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That is pretty special. So I just consider myself every day, I'm in the inheritance. I'm not worrying about the inheritance. Oh, families worry about, I was just talking with family this last week, all worried about what's coming to me. Oh, my goodness. People talking about things that, is not, that are not theirs yet, as though it is. When it comes to that, we think it's about our rights to the will and our rights to these things. Listen, the privilege of being a joint heir with Jesus Christ and an heir of the Father is, is an overwhelming privilege that's been given to every one of us. It's not a right. So we're not demanding. We're not, we're not there, but rather we are recognizing that we've been adopted into the family of God. That mean we've been chosen. So that means that the Father wants to share his wealth and his inheritance with us. Because he's really wealthy. Really, really wealthy. It's not only that, but if we'll share in his sufferings, we'll share in his glory. Many believers do not, do not, do not want anything to do with suffering. Suffering is a part of the gospel. We've just walked through the season of the death and the burial and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're right in the gap between then and Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But in Romans chapter 8 it speaks to us about having the privilege of sharing in the glory of God. Glory. What does the word glory mean? It's a wonderful practical meaning. The revealed visible presence of the invisible God. That's what glory is. You and I are carrying in these jars of clay the, the glory of God so that we can reveal the invisible presence of the invisible God in culture. We carry the invisible presence of the invisible God around in these bodies every day. It's the most beautiful thing I think that we could ever recognize that we are the glory of God. He has revealed His glory. He lives inside us. He wants to literally spread His glory through us. His revealed visible presence in the city of Calgary and beyond. Anybody interested? We take the glory of God to the communities. We've got glory so mystical and mystified that we've not been able to translate it into something that works every day. We reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's in us, on us, through us, and wants to be released from us. It's an amazing thing. Sorry that I got there on that subject of glory because it's, it's really quite a, quite a subject. And it's an Old Testament and a New Testament subject. Let's go to verse 28 for a moment. Verse 28 takes us into another dimension of the love of God. Verse 28 says to us, there's so many things in here, I didn't know what to highlight and what to skip. Anyways, read the chapter for yourself, okay? And we know that in all things, God's, God works for the good of those who love Him. Oh, now, this is what happens. He works for the good of those who love Him. So the last 
15 minutes is about God loving us. But now, talking about us loving Him. So this becomes this relational reciprocal. He loves us. We love Him. We love Him. He loves us. We love Him. He loves us. I love Him. He loves me. Isn't that awesome? And it's this great uh, exchange that happens because the love that I have received, I turn it back to Him. How many, uh, by chance this morning, happened to have your hands in the air in worship? Anybody? How many had your hands in the air? At least, I mean, I hope some of you did because they were, it was on the board. You know what I'm talking about? We are singing the lyrics. and You don't just sing them, you do the actions, right? That's the purpose of those things. And the beautiful thing about it is, is what did we do for 33 minutes this morning? We purposely, by design, turn back our love to Him because He's first loved us. Isn't that amazing? That's what these worship times are all about. It's not about, oh, I can't wait till they get over this, till they get to the message. No, no, no. We already had about 17 different messages in the songs that were sung. We could go home now. How many messages were preached before I opened the Scripture this morning here? At least 10. So the Holy Spirit is speaking in this room. Many subjects have been covered. And when I begin to look at it, it's about turning our love back to Him. I, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because He has been so good to me. He has, here's one, He's lavished His love. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon His sons and daughters that we might be called the sons and daughters of God. Let's go to verse number 31. See what it says here. What then shall we say in response to all these things? If God is for us, who then can be against us? Can somebody say that? Everybody together. If God be for us, who can be against us? Imagine if we lived that way. We live that way and that God is for us. Can you imagine if we get a comprehension of that into our spirit and it goes right down inside and we live every day recognizing that God is for me. God's for your marriage. God's for your home. God's for family. God's for your business. If God be for us, who then can be against us? Can we say, if God is for us? And say this, I know God's for me. And we got to know that in our knower so that we recognize it builds confidence. It builds peace and clarity in our lives. And then verse number 34, of course, is, is an incredible portion of Scripture that most of us know up probably off by heart. Verse number 34, it says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You know, I, I've not, not been able to comprehend that. That I have a God who prays for me. He ever lives to make intercession for us. You know his words in John chapter 16 to his disciples, he said, chapter 17, listen to this, I pray not for the world. That's interesting. Who's supposed to pray for the world? That's us. He said, I pray for you. So as he prays for us, we pray for the world that he sent us into. But I, I don't know about you, but there's times I get calls from people say, hey Ken, you've been on my heart, I'm praying for you. That warms my heart. I get text messages, you've been on my mind today, Ken, I'm praying for you. I mean that congregational members say, Pastor, you've been on my heart, I've been praying for you this week, even this morning just as I got here. How are you doing, Ken? We've been praying for you. That is not too shabby. And I receive all the prayers of God's people. But think about this this morning. The God of the universe 
is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he ever lives to make intercession for us. He prays for us. You ever been lonely? Just sit down somewhere and say, Jesus, I thank you that you're praying for me today. You ever felt rejection? He knows what rejection is all about. He was rejected, despised, hated, persecuted, beaten. And guess what he did it for? He did it for me. He did it for us. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I think what's happened in my journey of faith is my comprehension of that years ago instilled this incredible peace on the inside of me about knowing that I'm being prayed for by Jesus. We're not alone. We're probably always on his mind. You say, how can that be? Well, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. You know, he's everywhere. He knows everything about everything. <laughs> and he's praying. I don't, I don't know if you want it this morning, but he's praying for me. Anybody ever need some prayer? Have you ever sensed that Jesus has been praying for you? So how could I recognize? You ever felt you've been carried in places where you don't know how you got from where you are to where you were to where you are? He carries us. God is love expressed in his son. Shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. It's like they are the picture and the personification of true, beautiful, agape love for humanity. And I'm here to say to you today, in my priestly role, on behalf of him being a human being this morning, he loves you today. He set his affection upon you. Don't give me a but, but, but. No, no, just leave the butts alone or put your butt on the seat. Whatever you need to do, but put your butts alone. But if, if you know, no, 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 but if you, he loves us this morning. Can somebody say amen? You know, there's different kinds of prayers. There's beseeching prayer, asking prayer, uh, supplication prayer, intercession prayer, confession prayer, and there's Back to basics in prayer, there's at least six uh, dimensions of prayer. And when you go through, asking's asking, beseeching is stronger asking, supplication is deep entreaty, but intercession goes into another dimension where we stand in the gap and become one who stands there as a gapman for us in the middle of everything that we're doing. So when it says he is interceding for us, think about the times in our journey that he's been interceding for you, for me. There's some things I've come through in my journey of faith I don't know how I got through. Hey, you know, my brother passed two months ago. And um, he is my closest brother. He went to sleep uh, one night, Sunday night. By the way, it's after the Dallas Cowboys lost the foot count ball game. <laughs> we had some fun with that. He went to bed, laid down, never woke up. 76. So somebody had called me up. My, my sisters called me up and said, Ken, how are you doing? You just realized you've lost both of your brothers in the last two years. No one's asked me that question before. I said, how are you doing? Well, I said, it's like this. And this answer came out of me. I said, you know, 44 years ago, my mom passed. I was 27 years of age. You know, I haven't had a phone call from her in 44 years. And you know, my dad passed in 1994 at the age of 84. 
And for 30 years, I haven't had a phone call from my dad. And I said, you know, my, my beautiful father-in-law passed away 13 years ago. He called me every week, two to three times a week. He loved Cheryl and I. I haven't had a phone call from him in almost 14 years. And then my mother-in-law, she was smitten with dementia 10 years ago, and she hasn't talked to me or called me in 10 years, though she's living. My brother David passed three years ago. He suffered from a very rare disease, Huntington's chorea. Passed three years ago, but we, I didn't have my brother for probably 13 years. I never got a call from him. Always got calls. Now, my brother Paul, who passed, called me two to three, four times a week. But I haven't had a call the day before he passed. Because of the litany of people that I've just given you as an illustration, they loved me. And they prayed for me. So not only have I not received a phone call, they're not praying for me any longer. What happens is we don't even begin to think when we lose a loved one that was godly. Nine chances out of ten, they were praying for you. So we must recultivate a life of prayer ourselves. Because when mom goes, dad goes, father-in-law goes, all these people in our lives, they loved us deeply with the love of God in their hearts. And Paul would call me four or five times a week. How are you, Ken? What's up? What are you doing? You know, just... Got to go, but he'd be called, he'd just, my, my brother, my brother. I think sometimes the body of Christ has a great lack for phone calls. Why don't you call somebody this week? Tell them you love them while you have opportunity. If you've never pressed into the life of intercession, I encourage you to go beyond asking and beseeching and give yourself to this high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ and become a woman and a man that stands in the gap and become intercessors for the city, intercessors for your family, intercessors for your children and stand in the gap for those that need to be prayed for. Standing gap for a nation. He said, ask of me and I'll give you the nation. So we can go from individuals to nations and God will give us a nation well, I want you to know this morning that he ever lives to make intercession. Who can separate us here, verse 35, right through to the end? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Would it be trouble? Or would it be hardship? Would it be persecution? Or would it be famine? Or would it be nakedness? Would it be danger? Or would it be the sword itself? What can separate? Who can separate us from the love of God? Paul's coming to the end of this portion of the letter and he's, he's bringing it to a conclusion. We're out of condemnation. We've got one making intercession for us. We are heirs and joint heirs. We're adopted into the family of God. We're sons and daughters of God. And he said, what can separate us? Who can separate us from the love of God? And then the item, it, was Paul ever in trouble? Was he ever in hardship? Was he ever persecuted? Did he suffer famine and without food? Was he ever naked? The scripture says he was. Was he ever in danger? Was he threatened by the sword? And he is able to say in the midst of all this, as one who had experienced this, he's able to say, who shall separate us from the love of God? And then he comes up with this incredible answer. It says, no, in all these things we are more than, can we say more than conquerors? Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you very much.
<laughs> yes, sir. What happens when you believe that? Can anybody here say nothing? Anybody say neither? See, either death is not our enemy, man. The moment I pass, I go from living well to dying well to living well again. That's, that's what the scripture says. And, or light, neither angels or demons. Neither the present. So many people concerned the present and really concerned about our future. Nor any powers. Not height or depth or anything else. Let's read this phrase. Nor anything else in all creation. Think about that. Let's read that together. Nor anything else in all creation has the ability to separate us from the love of God. I'm going to put a caveat in there. What's a caveat, Ken? The caveat is your will. Choosing not to walk with him. Choosing to walk away from him. Choosing to reject your faith or move away or be like Demas. He has forsaken me having loved this present world. So there is a caveat and it's my will. It's the freedom of my will. But when it comes to God's part, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God. And even if we become prodigal, he is a waiting father waiting for us to come to him. What a beautiful picture of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. This is the last slide I shared with you the last time I was with you in Romans 1. And I said, I can't conclude this message until I take you to Romans chapter 8. And this is when we did communion after that because I took communion in the purple part out of this text in Romans chapter 8. The beauty, the beauty of this being the centerpiece. So I present to you the love of God that there is in Christ Jesus. And then I invite everyone in conclusion this morning to this next chapter of the love of God. I'm almost finished. Who can grasp the love of God? This has always intrigued me. When I was a student in college, we had uh, courses on instructions, receiving instructions, reading instructions, uh, giving instructions, writing instructions. And what happened is they wanted us, every one of us that are being trained, that we would raise our level of comprehension or grasping. So what they do is they put us all in a room and they put us in front of a um, goggles that we look through into a, into a film projector and they would give us uh, in information to read and we would read it. Then we had uh, 10 questions at the end of every one. So we'd have to read it, shut that screen off, and then answer the questions. So you know when you get a bunch of guys doing these kinds of things, they have one thing in mind. Who's going to be first, right? So all kinds of people, you know, like they just, they read the thing and they go to answer the questions and then they get two out of ten. Three out of ten. Because they're more concerned about being first than comprehending what they're supposed to comprehend so that we can write the instructions, give the instructions, etc., etc. But the, those who were slower in reading, they seemed to score higher because they slowed down so they could grasp the concept so that when the test came, they could give the proper answer and then move on to the next dimension. It's all kinds of people that read this book. They do their devotions and put it aside and walk away from it. But they're not comprehending what they're reading. And when it comes to the love of God, we have an invitation here. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Wow. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you can, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long, how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love, Ken, that surpasses knowledge, 
that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Forgot to put the scripture, Ephesians chapter 3. Can anybody say amen to this? Could I make a prayer over you today? That the Lord would raise the level of the comprehension of the love of God in this house. Anybody ready to receive that today? Because he, he wants to do that. And look, he says, how grasp how wide it is, how long it is, how high it is, how deep it is, is the love of Christ. And to know this love, think about that. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. What is the objective of culture right now? Knowledge. More knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge. Where is it taking us? Because when you have knowledge without wisdom, we're really left destitute as a culture. And I believe that as we penetrate into a comprehension of the love of God that passes knowledge, it is there that we step across into the next dimension where we become more than conquerors through him that loved us. And everybody said amen. Father, take this message this morning. And raise the level of our comprehension of what it means to be absolutely, totally loved by you. Thank you that you have not raised us to be automatons, but you have raised us as free moral agents that when we comprehend and understand, we are able to offer back to you intelligent, spirit-led praise, worship, and love back to your presence that we can come before your throne of grace and mercy, not wanting to get anything on some occasions, but is there to love you, and there to praise you, and there to honor you. And I pray, Father, in this house, that you would raise the comprehension of the love of God that passes knowledge in Jesus' name. And I pray that there will be a confidence in every one of our hearts that neither death nor life or anything else in all creation would be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Is there a shout in the house? A shout in the house? How many are interested in being more than a conqueror. Anybody interested in being more than? Hey, stand to your feet. Raise your hands with me. I'm looking for more than conquerors here this morning. So they're more. They want to be more than conquerors. Man, you got to get into that and try to expound upon that. What does it mean to be more than a con? More than an Alexander the Great. <laughs> more than a conqueror. I pray that a fresh spirit of courage and love will penetrate the hearts, minds, and spirits of this house. And that literally this house will have a conquering spirit. A more than conquering spirit. And I pray for those of us who struggle in our flesh. We want to be more than a conqueror. But we struggle on the inside. Holy Spirit, I invite you today to put to death what needs to die. And make alive in every one of us what needs to be made alive so that we can walk in this journey of faith as more than conquerors through you that loved us. We give you praise this morning and we say thank you for your goodness, your kindness, and your love that you have demonstrated towards every one of us in this room. And we sense today that we are enveloped by your love and your arms are wrapped around us and saying I unconditionally love you in the name of my Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May this congregation be blessed. May you be encouraged. May you be built up. May growth come to everyone. May financial limitations be broken off. May new people come out of darkness into light because of the radiant, evervescent love of God that is being shone abroad by every heart in this place in the name of Jesus. Receive all the honor and all the glory and all the praise in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you praise, Father.
We worship you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your kindness and your grace. We are more than conquerors. Again, thank you for that great message and great prayer. But I think you have another prayer for us. Yes. <laughs> Derek and Chris, could you join me this morning? Next Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 27th of April. Yes. Oh. 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 How do I remember that date? I know. I'm here to help you. <laughs> I've already got her card. And, and we got your card also. <laughs> Saturday. I'm pretty sharp. I've been doing this a lot of years. Yeah, I so can see. It doesn't pay That's to forget. That's why we need prayers this morning. <laughs> Saturday, Ken and Cheryl celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> I was reading in Amos 6 this week in the message. It says, don't take yourself too serious. Take God serious. Thank you for taking God serious. Thank you. Thank you that from that place, you've chosen Cheryl over and over and over again because you've chosen God over and over again because he's chosen you. Thank you. This morning, we want to honor you as an eldership team. John and Ames can't be here with us this morning, but as a congregation and as an eldership, we will honor you and Cheryl for the journey, for your faithfulness to God's covenant with him and one another. And I wonder if I can ask every married couple to stand up this morning. And even if you are standing in faith for someone else's marriage, I want I you to stand. Can I ask you to pray for us? Oh, yes. Pray over marriages. We recognize Absolutely. the journey this morning Jesus. and the gift of covenant. So I want to ask you to pray for us, please, Ken. Yes. Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are God that makes covenant and you keep covenant. Thank you for role modeling that for us. I thank you today for my wife who has unconditionally loved me for a half a century. I am grateful, undeserving. Thank you for giving her to me as a gift. Not just a good gift, but a perfect gift designed by your hand that we might live as complements with one another. Thank you that you, I can testify that you have been with us these last 50 years. You have led us, you've guided us, you've helped us walk through the troubles, the difficulties, the good times, the loss of children, the loss of family, the loss of income. You have helped us. I thank you, Father, for generational righteousness, for my father and mother-in-law that loved one another for almost 60 years. My sister, who's married 60 years, and all these examples around us. Not about the longevity, but about the keeping of covenant. And Father, I pray that Cheryl and I would be able to model the example of two imperfect people that God brought together to be perfected by his grace and by his word. Father, I pray for this congregation. I pray over the families and the marriages that are standing here today. With your hands raised up, I'd like to give to you a charge that I've given to hundreds of people that I've married over these last five decades. Look into the eyes of your spouse this morning and say this after me. You have chosen your love. Now love your choice. Thank you that marriage is not our idea, but it's your idea. And 
I speak a blessing and a grace over every relationship. And Father, I pray that each person in the marriage will embrace the agape love of God for their relationship. That you give them your ability to love their spouse. In Jesus' name. Though we all may demonstrate faults that we have eyes to see beyond and see the gift that you have given. I stretch my hands over all these beautiful families and in the name of the Father and the name of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May no covenant be broken. But may we keep our word. <laughs> word given, word kept in every relationship. In Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen. Father, I want to thank you this morning. That even though we recognize our imperfections, yeah. I thank you that we still reflect you. Yeah. Thank you that we still have the privilege of reflecting you. I want to thank you for what Ken and Cheryl have reflected of you to one another, to their family, to their churches that they've served so faithfully, to this city and to this nation. Thank you for what they've represented as a married couple, as a united force, even to other nations that they've fell, fallen in love with, that they've traveled to, and that they've served. I thank you, Father, that we don't place them on a pedestal this morning, but instead that they turn our eyes to you by who they are, by who they represent. But this morning, we thank you for them. We thank you for the selflessness that they've served even our community with. So we do pray your blessing, your protection, your health, your ongoing provision, your ongoing kindness to them. We know that that's your very nature, but I thank you, Father, that we'll see the outworking and continue to see the outworking of that in and through them. We pray that even where the enemy would still have plans to trip them up, to steal, kill, and destroy, we thank you this morning that this word out of Romans, that we are still conquerors and more than conquerors applies to them too. So we thank you that they will continue to be conquerors in you because of you. So we thank you that you continue to give them godly perspective. May we too have godly perspective, kingdom perspective eternal perspective because of being rooted and established in you and in your love. We thank you for that this morning in Jesus' name. We pray the shalom peace over them. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful morning? So beautiful. Father, we honor you this morning. I want to say to you, I have a little bag here um, with some really cool glasses. Um, if you want to be like me, <laughs> or if you don't have sunglasses, because the sun is really bright now, this morning, for everyone, did you see the table at the back when you came in? No one noticed? What? There's a table at the back. <laughs> if you go there this morning... And you ask Jessica, she'll be there, any question about Hello Summer. Any, any question. You'll get one of these. Isn't that cool? It comes with a little case. It says life connection. Many colors. But only today only. 